Hello and welcome to a look ahead to what the papers will be bringing us tomorrow. Tom, the director tonight, helpfully singing along with the theme tune in my ear. Uh, political commentator Joe Phillips and political editor of The People and The Sunday Mirror. Nigel Nelson are with us. They were tapping their feet, playing the maracas, castanets, whatever they've got to hand. Let's start the front pages then with the Sunday Telegraph. It leaves with the tribute paid by Prince Charles to the Duke of Edinburgh, calling him a very special person. That tribute by the Prince of Wales is also on the front page of the Sunday Express. The newspaper adds that the Prince said he misses his father enormously. Sunday Times also leaves with Prince Charles' emotional farewell to his father. It also carries details of the Duke's funeral, which is to take place next Saturday in Windsor. The Sunday Mirror reports that Prince Harry is due back in the UK and that he will join his brother William for his grandfather's funeral procession. The Mail on Sunday reports that the Duke will be carried to St George's Chapel at uh, Windsor Castle in a Land Rover, which he helped to design. Let's make a start then um, with the uh, Sunday Telegraph, uh, Nigel, reflecting the, uh, the warm tribute that uh, Prince Charles made to his father and um, the papers chosen to put a a photograph of the two men smiling together. Yes, and it also is making the point that um, the two of them became much closer in recent years. There, there'd always been a feeling that um, Prince Charles and the Duke of Edinburgh weren't terribly close, that they disagreed on a number of things. And of course, in, Char in Charles's younger days, it was Earl Mountbatten who became his sort of father figure. But apparently that the uh, that um, Charles and his father were talking daily uh, towards the, the end of Prince Philip's life. And it's kind of, uh, it, it's kind of not nice to know that background when you saw the moving tribute that Charles gave. To come out and do it off the cuff was exactly the right, the right kind of tone. To thank the nation for all their support, um, um, also is the right thing to do. It was a very relax, relaxed kind of um, address, not some kind of a big national moment, just somebody who misses his dad terribly and wanted to say thank you for everybody else because they're grieving too. Yes, I mean, the yes, Sunday, I mean, the Sunday, Sunday, Sunday Times, Sunday. Joe, um, has a similar headline, Charles pays tribute to his uh, dear papa. And... and it's, it's much easier, isn't it, to, to, to understand what they're going through when you just think of them as a normal family. Yes, they're a royal family. They have a lot of privilege. They live in extraordinary places. But their grief is exactly the same. Absolutely. And as you were saying earlier, Martin, you know, yesterday when we heard the news, you think of the Queen. 73 years she and the Duke of Edinburgh were married. That is an enormously incomprehensible long time for a couple to be together um, and of course there are the four children the grandchildren and great-grandchildren and I think you know in this particular time when so many families have lost loved ones have gone through extremely difficult circumstances um, because of coronavirus the Queen has been um, she's been a great sort of healer um, and without being a sort of a, a, a sort of a rally rallying figurehead there is that sort of sense of calm and I think in a way this sadness for them although obviously at 99 and the fact that the Duke had been ill for a considerable amount of time it wasn't unexpected but I think as you say it is this sense that yes they are a family um, and in some ways the fact that the funeral at the Duke's only own request is not going to be um, a great big state funeral. It's going to be very, very limited because of coronavirus. In a way, that must be some comfort. They haven't got to worry about, you know, which head of state sits next to which head of state and all of that stuff. And of course, he hated all of that pomposity and flummery and, and all the rest of it. So, um, yeah, I think it's, it's a, it is that whole sense of it's a family mourning the loss of somebody who was incredibly important, obviously. And that's reflected, Nigel, on the Sunday Mirror. United in grief, we know that Prince Harry is coming back from the United States for the service. Yes, we do indeed. And what the, the Sunday Mirror is reporting is that there are hopes that there'll be some kind of rapprochement between Prince Harry and Prince William, who've not been getting on terribly well of late. And here we go again. It, this is... This is the family and families fall out, brothers fall out, and that's what's happened in this case. 
And there is some hope that the fact that the two of them will walk behind the Land Rover carrying Prince Philip's coffin, and the fact they'll be together, although Harry's going to have to isolate a bit when he gets here, the fact they'll be together will give them a chance to actually have a proper heart-to-heart, -heart, sort out their differences. And it would be, I would imagine, one of Prince Philip's greatest wishes if the two of them can actually part as friends, which is exactly what they used to be, because they were very close. The Mail on Sunday, uh, Joe, talks about um, the Countess of Wessex, Sophie Wessex's reaction. She was asked how the Queen was coping. Amazing, she said, as she drove away from Windsor today. Yes, and um, she looked a bit um, teary-eyed, as you'd expect. And it, it's quite interesting. I mean, um, Sophie, the Countess of Wessex, who's married to um, Prince Edward, um, is very close to the Queen, apparently, um, and she's one of the Queen's quartet of very trusted um, women, which include Princess Anne, Lady Pamela Hicks, who's a childhood friend of the Queen's, and her dresser, uh, Angela Kelly. Um, and in a sense, I think Sophie has perhaps become a sort of a another daughter alongside Princess Anne. They obviously, the Queen and, and Sophie get on very well. And she's one of those sort of minor royals that we don't hear an awful lot about, but appears to just get on with doing what is required of her. Um, and at a time when, you know, we've all seen so many uh, members of the royal family, particularly the minor royals, seeking fame and glory and perhaps the wrong sort of headlines, I think perhaps Sophie is, is perhaps a breath of fresh air. The Sunday People, Land Rover and out. Not your usual hearse for the Duke, Nigel. No, it, it, one of the things that is coming out is that um, Prince Philip seem, seemed to uh, seem to have been planning his funeral absolutely meticulously. I'm sure he thought there would be more than 30 guests, but he couldn't have actually predicted the pandemic. Um, but yes, this is the Land Rover that will will uh, take will take him to his funeral, and it's a Defender gun bus which he had specially designed for himself uh, a few years ago. And it has a handcrafted rear, and that is where the coffin will go. So it, it's extraordinary the amount of time Prince Philip must have spent thinking about, about this particular day. And, of course, we all hope it'll go off as well as, well as these things possibly can. It ought to go off with military precision. And um, <laughs> I, I'm, I look forward to seeing this vehicle, Joe. Yes, absolutely. And I, I think we all have learned a lot about the, the Duke of Edinburgh um, over the last 24 hours. And um, he was very, very keen on design and engineering, as well as the arts and sport and the environment and everything else. And I think, you know, the idea of him maybe drawing it out and then finding the bits and working in a workshop and, you know, putting some ovals on, I think, I think it's rather, rather touching. And I dare say there might be replicas available to people um, or, or else it might appear in some other form after it's been used for the funeral. Yes, yeah, a lovely image, isn't it, that? Uh, another a different story now on the Sunday Times. And, Nigel, we need you to sort of give us a bit of background to this because it can get a bit complicated, the old green sill David Cameron story. Uh, Nuts email triggers fresh green sill questions for XPM. Just explain the background briefly, if you would. OK. Um, the David Cameron uh, gave Lex Green, uh, uh, green, green, green Sill, who is an Australian financier, access to Downing Street when he was Prime Minister and went on to work for him as an advisor. And during the time that, uh, since he's been Prime Minister, uh, he's been trying to broker a number of deals on behalf of the fin financier for which he would make a great deal of money if they, they'd come off. Now, what the Sunday Times is telling us is that one of these was for uh, a, an, a payment app for the NHS, which NHS workers could use for free. And he arranged a private drink between uh, the health secretary uh, and Lex Greensill to discuss this. Now, there's no suggestion that, that, that Matt Hancock behaved in any way improperly. He passed the request straight on to officials. But there is a big question about whether or not prime ministers should be lobbying quite so soon after they've left office, that um, it must be very difficult for Matt Hancock to have turned down a request for a drink with his ex-boss. It would be difficult for all of us to do that. 
that. So maybe we, we should start thinking about some new rules around uh, former prime ministers. And I think I would suggest that they shouldn't be allowed to lobby for 10 years, uh, into, uh, for 10 years after leaving office. Because this is getting more and more complicated, Joe, isn't it? More and more ministers being connected, even if they're not implicated. Yes, exactly. I mean, we've got the Chancellor, um, now Matt Hancock, um, you know, and, and it's not so much about the sort of whether or not it was actually breaking the law technically or not. It's the perception and the perception is of sleaze and corruption, which, you know, we've been around this track many, many times with um, expenses, scandals um, and various other things. We've got question marks still over contracts that have been awarded during coronavirus, you know, obviously done very quickly without the normal sort of due diligence and tendering process for understandable reasons. But it would seem that many have gone to friends or acquaintances of people in government. And this just adds to that sense of entitlement, of shortcuts, of going round the back. I mean, we do know um, that many, many businesses were willing and were offering a to help whether it was making PPE or other equipment at the beginning of the outbreak but we also know that many businesses have gone to the wall so here you have a former prime minister basically saying it's nuts not to consider um, the, the Covid emergency recovery fund for Greensill um, for a company that you know, had it not gone down the pan, um, David Cameron would have made millions out of it. As it is, he's, he's got nothing because it, he, um, they've declared bankruptcy. But it is all about perception. And I think, you know, there are questions that need to be asked. And Nigel's right. I mean, this sort of thing, it needs to be looked at again. I mean, many, many ministers, not just prime ministers, go on to get, um, you know, well-paid directorships and other things. But, you know, if you've been prime minister... You're on the speaking circuit. You can flog your memoirs. There's plenty of money to be made without something that looks, to be perfectly honest, rather tawdry. Let's finish, we must, with a mention of Rachel Blackmore on the Daily Star Sunday. Why the long face, it asks, of her horse, Manila Times, on which she won the Grand National, the first woman to do so, Nigel? Indeed, indeed she is. Um, and it was, I thought it was an extremely exciting race that uh, she'd swept the board at Cheltenham uh, before. And so I think this, this was a well-deserved win. Uh, I made a slight mistake in part one when I suggested there were no, no tragedies this year at uh, the Grand National. But of course, uh, the long mile actually did fall and had to be, uh, had to be put, put to sleep afterwards. But uh, it is, the, the, on the plus side, one of only two fatalities amongst horses in the last eight years since uh, new uh, uh, safety regulations came into play. But no, I mean, all, you know, uh, I think that it was absolutely great great for Rachel. Uh, I liked her comment at the end that it wasn't about being male or female. She didn't even feel human at the end of that race. But I think that uh, uh, she's a great example to other women in the sport, which, of course, is one of the few where women and men compete, can compete equally. Yes, we well, have to stand corrected on this, though, because Colin Wilson points out motor race has sex equality and uh, Andrew Lachlan says that other forms of um, equestrianism do too, Joe. So uh, plenty of opportunities to compete against the men, just briefly. Well, absolutely. But I'm, I'm so overwhelmed with Nigel's intense knowledge of horse racing. I'm, I'm really quite surprised. I think Cornelius Lysett needs to uh, look over his shoulder with nice little Nelson coming. But, you know, congratulations to Rachel Blackmore. I think it's absolutely brilliant. 44 years after the first woman competed in the Grand National. A great shame there weren't lots and lots of people there to cheer her on, because I think a, it would have been deafening. It is a great shame. And we might even get Nigel interested in cricket at this rate. Um, oh, don't that, be silly. <laughs> that's it for um, the papers uh, tonight. Lovely to see you both. Joe and Nigel, thank you uh, very much. That's the second edition done and dusted for you. Do buy a paper in the morning, won't you? The film review is coming up next. But that's all from us for tonight. Night-night.